A stressed brain does the opposite. A stressed brain is an aging, ineffective, inefficient brain. ADHD is a relatively new diagnosis. The story of how it came to be an official diagnosis is a bit backwards and somewhat surprising. So doctors experimented with a class of drugs that stimulated the brain, and they happened to help people to focus. Then they, during the clinical testing process, they had some success helping people with problems focusing to focus. So now they needed a name for a diagnosis of people that couldn't focus to go along with that drug's effect. And that's the birth of the diagnosis of ADHD. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. So the drug came first, then the diagnosis. Now, given this new diagnosis, doctors are now able to prescribe this drug to millions of people, notably children with inappropriate inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. It pretty much sounds like most children in general, doesn't it? But as long as this behavior went on for an extended period of time and was problematic enough to cause problems at home and school, those children were given that diagnosis of ADHD and given this new drug, or one of them. Then we started to classify different variants of this ADHD diagnosis for children. Some people can't focus and are hyperactive. Some aren't. Some are predominantly inattentive, while others are predominantly hyperactive. And then, of course, there's the unspecified combined group. So these drugs started to hit the black market for adults. They began abusing them to help them to focus at, uh, or perform better at work. So the pharmaceutical industry took this as an opportunity to create a new population of customers that could benefit from these drugs so that they could increase their profits rather than losing sales to the black market. So because of this, now we have the diagnosis of adult onset ADHD. Now I'm not here to tell you that these drugs don't work and that ADHD doesn't exist. Oftentimes the drugs do work. I mean, just talk to any parent or teacher of a child diagnosed with ADHD who's used these medications and you'll get the answer. But what I want to impart is the why behind the tendencies towards this lack of focus and hyperactivity in the first place. The class of drugs that I'm referring to, they're, they're all variants of amphetamine. They tweak the molecule here and there to patent a new drug or to get a slightly different mechanism of action to get a short term effect or maybe a longer term effect. But they're all a variation of this stimulant, amphetamine. Amphetamines jack up dopamine. When you increase dopamine in the brain, you'll help people to focus temporarily until the dopamine falls off again as the drug gets metabolized out of the body, as happens with other stimulants like cocaine. The user now is constantly needing more and more of this drug to benefit from the side effects. I'm not going to go into a deep dive here about dopamine. There are others that have done that who are far more qualified than I am. But if you're interested in further research, one of my favorite books on this is called It's Dopamine Nation, uh, written by Anna Lemke. I'm also not going to go deep into the societal problems of confining children to classrooms at ages when they are little bundles of energy and curiosity. They're forced to be sedentary, listen to an instructor during a time in their lives where they should be out exploring and frolicking and playing with peers and learning from the natural world in a natural way. Nor am I gonna give my thoughts on the numerous man-made chemicals in our environment today that we inhale and consume in our food and water that go into the brain and act to change nerve pathways contributing to behavior problems, inattention, and lack of focus in children. Simply Google the fine gold diet if you want to skim the surface of that subject. What I do want to discuss is one of the most powerful modulators of the structure and function of the brain, stress. Stress damages and changes the brain in numerous compounded ways that alter the structure and function of our brain in a negative way. The stress hormone cortisol changes the brain through altering DNA expression. So this is called epigenetics. I've done an entire video on epigenetics previously, so if you're curious, I recommend you check out that video. Short-term or acute stress actually improves our brain, makes us more alert, enhances neural activity, uh, and, and other neural brain circuits. It makes sense, right? That makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. If we're going to survive, the sharper the brain, the better we're able to detect danger, the better our chances of survival. 
the hypervigilance in the brain caused by excess cortisol, it occurs through cortisol telling the brain to enhance a, the production of certain excitatory neurotransmitters, notably one called glutamate. And it suppresses the production of other inhibitory neurotransmitters that you've probably heard of, uh, serotonin and GABA. And in the short term, this enhances sharpness, attention, memory, focus. But there's good stress, which is short-term and acute, and enhances our physiologic function. And then there's bad stress, or basically too much of a good thing. When we extend stress physiology beyond the short-term into the chronic or long-term, then the effects of stress on the body, including the brain, it takes a turn for the worse. Acute stress, good. Chronic stress, bad. I said earlier that the effects of stress on the brain are numerous. And what I just mentioned was the epigenetic change and the neurotransmitter imbalance that it causes. But there are numerous other ways that stress physiology compromise our brain, leading to a bunch of physiologic symptoms and conditions, anxiety, depression, insomnia, ADHD, brain fog, and more. Here are four concrete ways that chronic stress can contribute to a lack of focus, inattentiveness, hyperactivity, and even learning disabilities associated with that diagnosis of ADHD. The first mechanism underlying these stress-related brain issues is an increase in oxidative stress. This causes direct damage to numerous parts of the brain. Oxidative stress is basically too many, too many free radicals Many of us have heard about these free radicals. These are little molecules that have a positive or negative charge, and these molecules go into the blood and they damage any tissue that they bump into. The body generates these free radicals as a result of this sped up metabolism from stress. So you can think of it like the exhaust of your car as you're driving down the road 100 miles an hour. Well, the body's form of exhaust is free radicals. I think of these free radicals, they're like a pinballs in an old school pinball machine just bouncing around all over the body wherever the blood goes and nicking and damaging tissue and because the blood goes everywhere the damage is everywhere including in your brain. The second way chronic stress can contribute to the diagnosis of ADHD has to do with blood volume which is simply how much water do we have in our blood. Blood volume is mostly water. Chronic stress contributes to low blood volume which means the blood delivers less oxygen to the brain, which of course is vital for its functionality. And this has to do with a different hormone in the adrenals called aldosterone, not cortisol. And this helps us to hold on to sodium, salt, which helps us to hold on to water. It's osmosis basically, and blood volume is mostly water. So here's that progression if you follow along. Stress compromises adrenal function, which lowers sodium, which lowers water, which lowers blood volume, which basically means the elevator's not getting to the top floor. Not enough blood in the brain. The third primary way that stress contributes to the symptoms associated with ADHD is that stress hormone damages our mitochondria. Mitochondria are the little energy producers in our cells and in our brain. There's hundreds and thousands in each cell. They take energy from food and turn it into this universal form of energy called ATP, that we can use as a fuel to perform pretty much any function necessary in the body. Thinking a thought, making a decision, creating a memory. Now the brain consumes 20 to 25% of our total daily energy. So it stands to reason that if our energy supply is low, our brain doesn't function as well as it should, and we have a lack of focus and attention. Now the last, but by no means least way, chronic stress can contribute to ADHD is a mechanism referred to as neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity refers to the changing or remodeling of the brain and its nerve pathways. We're using neuroplasticity in a positive way when we learn to ride a bike or learn a new language, but neuroplasticity can also go in a negative direction. The first three damaging mechanisms that I mentioned alter neuroplasticity for the worse. We create a situation in the brain that is the exact opposite of what occurs in childhood where neurons are growing and developing and multiplying. A stressed brain does the opposite. A stressed brain is an aging, ineffective, inefficient brain. Now the good news is this is all fixable. The solution lies in the reversal of those damaging mechanisms. 
we don't even have to target each of these individual negative processes through lifestyle modifications, dietary changes, and some supplements here and there to optimize cellular function, the brain can heal. We can reverse the negative neuroplastic effects of the brain, and we can instill and change it and stimulate the positive ones. Your brain can heal.